I'm Katie Barlow. Coming up on In the Courts, a local lawsuit over gun safety regulations could end up in the Supreme Court. Hear from those on both sides of that issue, and I'll go one on one with DC's U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves and WWE founder Vince McMahon accused of sex trafficking and more. A lot to cover, so let's get started. Welcome in Anne Arundel County making national headlines this week, winning a court battle with gun shop owners that could now be on its way to the Supreme Court. The county is allowed to require gun shop owners to distribute leaflets on peaceful conflict resolution and suicide prevention. That's according to a unanimous federal appeals court led by conservative judge Paul Niemeyer. Anne Arundel County declared a public health crisis in 2022 as after tracking yearly increases in suicides. So the county passed an ordinance that required places that sell guns and ammunition to display and distribute these pamphlets that Maryland gun shop owners say suggest guns may cause suicide and it may dissuade potential buyers and dampen the exercise of Second Amendment rights. We don't say that guns cause suicide. What we what is said in the, the brochure is that it is cordless. Guns are a correlation of suicide. In other words, it, it, it increases the factors that lead to suicide. And the court saw that for what it was, the plain language of the, the brochure, which in fact was developed by not only the, the Suicide National the Suicide Foundation, but also the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is the gun lobby. So the gun lobby helped develop this brochure. Four gun shop owners and gun rights group Maryland Shall Issue challenged the ordinance. They argued that it violates their First Amendment right not to speak or to be free from the government telling you what you have to say. They're following a Supreme Court case that says, look, the government is allowed to compel you to speak in certain circumstances, if it's factual, if it's uncontroversial, and if it's about the terms of service of a deal. That's not what's happening here, they argue. The terms of services, no one's rendering suicide services who are selling firearms. Those, these pamphlets do not relate in the slightest to the terms of services that these dealers are performing. No one contests that. But the county is saying, well, we don't care. You have to talk about it. See, that's just unconstitutional. That's compelled speech. It's no more constitutional being uh, allowing the, the county to censor what you may say. The two rights, not to speak and to not be censored, are of equal importance. A three-judge panel disagreed, reasoning that the speech was reasonably tailored to the government's interest in reducing suicide. The court said these leaflets are no, really no different than other government warnings that are allowed during commercial transactions, like the Surgeon General's warning on a pack of cigarettes. The gun shop owners plan to appeal, which could go up to the Supreme Court. And meantime, in Manhattan, former President Donald Trump's defamation damages trial hitting a few bumps this week. A juror reported feeling ill, delaying testimony for two days. And Trump attorney Alina Haba also told the judge she's not feeling well. She told the judge that on Monday, just one day before the New Hampshire primary. This photo was taken on election night in New Hampshire at Trump's victory party. Unfortunately, the guy who took the picture with Alina Haba, a former Trump campaign staffer who once told police officers to hang themselves on January 6th, he was escorted out of the party after he posted that photo to social media. I'm getting removed from the Trump event. Why do I have to leave, sir? Can you tell me why? Like, I have knocked more than 12,000 doors for President Trump. I've done everything I've... I'm getting kicked out right now, guys. Guys, I'm getting kicked out of the Trump event for no reason. And while Trump was taking the stand in New York, his former White House aide, Peter Navarro, was sentenced to four months in prison. That was for ignoring a congressional subpoena from the committee investigating January 6th. Federal Judge Amit Mehta told Navarro that this sentencing was not a political prosecution and that this is a circumstance of your own making, he told Navarro. Also... Now in D.C. this week, the federal appeals court based in the district turned down Trump's appeal to toss a gag order that prevents him from talking about witnesses and about court staff while he's facing those criminal charges for efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Trump lost before a three-judge panel on the D.C. circuit. He tried to go en banc. If you remember that from last week, that means asking all 11 judges on the court to rehear the case. But the court said nope. 
Now he can appeal the gag order to the Supreme Court, and they're likely to build quite the Trump docket in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, at the Supreme Court this week, they allowed the Biden administration to cut razor wire that Texas had installed along a portion of the U.S.-Mexico border. A woman and two children attempting to cross the border died earlier this month near that area. A federal appeals court had blocked Border Patrol agents from taking down the wire. In a split 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court lifted that order. Justices Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh all disagreed they would have kept it in place. Now, Texas is framing it as a Biden administration move to impose on their right of self-defense. But not everyone agrees with that framing. The Supreme Court's decision on Monday is actually very limited. The justices in this unexplained, unsigned 5-4 to four order only cleared the way for the Biden administration to remove the razor wire along the border. They didn't say that anything Governor Abbott has done is unlawful. They didn't say that he's ultimately going to lose this lawsuit. They didn't say much, actually. That decision came down via the shadow docket, so no explanation of the court's thinking here. And speaking of the Supreme Court, Louisiana's Governor Jeff Landry just signed into law a new congressional map that has two majority black districts for the state's six seats in the House of Representatives. This comes after the Supreme Court's decision last June finding that Alabama's congressional map with only one majority black district for the state's seven seats likely violated the Voting Rights Act. And Alabama executed a man using nitrogen gas this week. The Supreme Court denied a request to stop the controversial execution, clearing the way for the nation's first use of the gas in an execution. That man is Kenneth Smith, a 58-year-old who was convicted in a murder-for-hire plot of a preacher's wife. Smith's 2022 lethal injection was called off at the last minute when authorities couldn't find a vein. The state of Alabama says the new method is humane. To carry it out, a mask is put over the inmate's face and air is reported replaced with pure nitrogen gas. And this week, we're getting a rare look inside a courtroom, one where cameras are allowed, this time in Michigan, as the parents of Ethan Crumbly go on trial. Crumbly killed four of his fellow students and injured seven more when he opened fire at a high school in Oxford, Michigan, back in 2021. Crumbly's mother, Jennifer, is on trial first, facing four charges for involuntary manslaughter. All eyes are on this case. It could set the standard for prosecutors holding parents criminally responsible when a child commits murder in a school shooting. One of the questions is how much she knew before her son killed four people and whether she knew enough to stop it. When someone with that kind of information looks at this, the unimaginable becomes predictable. It becomes reasonably foreseeable. That's why, even though she didn't pull the trigger on November the 30th, she's responsible for those deaths. Ethan's father, James Crumbly, will face similar charges in a separate trial that one's set for March 5th. Meanwhile, in Kentucky, families of victims of a deadly shooting last April are suing the gun shop that sold the shooter an AR-15. The man who worked at Old National Bank fired off more than 40 rounds in just about eight minutes, killing five co-workers and later shooting a police officer responding, according to the police report. He wrote in his journal that it was, quote, so easy to buy the gun and ammunition. Families accused the gun shop of failing to notice red flags before the purchase. The lawsuit alleges this act of widespread devastation and loss of life was made possible because River City Firearms ignored obvious warning signs when the shooter entered the store to purchase an assault weapon while he was in the midst of a mental breakdown just one week before the shooting. Now to an update on that former top Saudi intelligence official who claims assassins tried to murder him in Canada. He argues that much of the plan to kill him was actually worked out on U.S. soil, so he's entitled to money damages under the Torture Victims Protection Act. He's suing the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, and Bloomberg Law reports that on Monday during oral argument before the federal appeals court in D.C., the judges seemed open to allowing more discovery in the case, which means that both sides will be required to give up the relevant information to the claims. And right here in our region, a Honduran immigrant who was in the country illegally was in court this week facing federal criminal charges for punching an immigration official, according to prosecutors. Lemus Ramos also facing charges in Fairfax County for sexually assaulting a minor and child porn. ICE claims the Fairfax County Sheriff's deputies released Ramos from custody even though he was subject to an immigration detainer. A spokesperson for the sheriff's office said Ramos actually posted bond before their office received that information. 
that he was subject to a detainer. According to state prosecutors, Ramos was allowed free after posting a $3,000 bond. The sheriff says they didn't refuse to honor an ICE detainer, calling ICE's claims blatantly false. But ICE says they stand by their story. And if you've been enjoying D.C.'s Restaurant Week, you better take a second look at your bill. Several D.C. restaurants, including Mi Vida and Succotash, are now facing a lawsuit claiming they have deceptive menu prices. The Washingtonian reports that the restaurant group, including those spots, quickly dropped that 3.5% Initiative 82 fee that showed up on every bill. D.C. voters passed Initiative 82 to raise the minimum wage for tipped workers, but it has led to some confusion for diners when they get that final bill. And in Virginia, a group of Alexandria residents are suing the city over the decision to eliminate single-family zoning and allow the construction of buildings with up to four units. They claim the city violated its charter and the Virginia Constitution. A similar lawsuit was filed in Arlington over the same plan to create missing middle housing. And still ahead, I'm joined by Matthew Graves, U.S. Attorney for D.C. You won't want to miss that conversation. That's next.